I'm 15, standing in the hall bathroom of the house in Las Vegas where we live, staring at my face in the mirror over the sink. In my hand is a wet washcloth covered in blood. What I'm seeing in the mirror doesn't make sense. My lower lip is flopping in two pieces, a jagged cut like an upside down Y severing the right half from the left half. I touch the torn edges of my lip with my fingertips, watching my hand move in the reflection as if it's on TV. Why don't I feel any pain? My mom rushes into the bathroom with ice cubes, wrapping them in the washcloth. Oh, dear Jesus. Here, hold this up to your mouth. Daddy's getting the car. We're taking you to the emergency room. Mom always was good in a crisis, but we'd never had one like this. I'd been bitten in the face by someone else's dog in my own backyard. And not just any dog, an Akita, a breed we later learned was developed in Japan to hunt bears. You could say I ended up on my way to the emergency room with a torn up face due to a philosophical difference. My mom couldn't say no to someone who needed help, which sometimes extended to bringing animals and people into our home. My dad thought generosity should have limits, especially when it affected the rest of us. I'd have sided with my mom until I got caught in the middle. When I was in elementary school, years before the Akita took a chunk out of my face, mom took in an 18-year-old girl named Claudia who slept on a cot in our sewing room. Claudia had been kicked out of her house or ran away both of which were incomprehensible to me. We were a traditional 70s suburban family. My engineer dad worked at the power company. My mom was a homemaker. My older sister took piano lessons and was getting into boys. And I made up scenes with my Playmobil characters and had a secret club with my best friend. <laughs> Claudia wore flowing hippie skirts headscarves in her mass of red hair, and didn't seem to do much except loll on the cot reading. I didn't dislike Claudia, but having her in our house was weird. I'd come home from school, and she'd be there in our space. I didn't know what to talk to her about, and she didn't seem interested in me anyway. Plus, she always had this odd, sharp smell about her. It never occurred to me to question why my mother had taken her in. It was just the way it was. I asked my dad recently if he remembered where Claudia came from. Oh, she bounced around in the homes of that freeform evangelical group your mother belonged to, he said. And she invited her in. Your mother did things like that. Claudia only stayed with us a few weeks. After Dad caught her smoking, which was verboten, she had to go. I didn't miss her. But her short stay made an impression. Aside from family staying over the holidays, I thought our home was just for us. That I could come home and find a stranger living with us was unsettling. When Mom's largesse extended to cats, it felt completely different. When I was a baby, a woman my mom knew was moving to an apartment that didn't allow pets. So my parents took in her Siamese brother-sister pair. My dad loved cats, so this was not a problem. I grew up with Raja and Sasha as constant furry companions. Then the daughter of an acquaintance developed an allergy, so a beautiful Russian blue came to live with us. Later, we took in a shy one-year-old seal point. And once, a long-haired white cat with blue eyes followed my mother home. True story. <laughs> it obviously belonged to someone, but after trying to find the owner with no luck, we added her to the household. <laughs> we became very much a cat family, with adoptive kitties living out their lives as pampered indoor-only pets. In the years since Claudia, 
mom hadn't invited anyone but cats to live with us. <laughs> that is, until the summer I turned 15, when Maureen showed up. Maureen was a middle-aged acquaintance of my mom's who had been left with almost nothing when her husband died. She needed a place to stay while she looked for a job. Well, why don't you stay with us, my mom offered. My older daughter has moved out, and Louise will be at camp for a month. We've got plenty of room. That's when Maureen told her about the dog, her beloved Akita. She didn't want to part with him, but it was hard to find somewhere she could stay with a 130-pound animal. I don't know what the conversation was like between my parents when mom told my dad she'd invite us, invited this woman to stay with us who, by the way, had a large dog. Dad was not a dog person. But he also didn't think it would be right to take back the offer. The two of them could stay until early September. The day Maureen and the dog moved in was the day dad drove me to camp. Then he came home and saw a much larger animal than he was expecting romping around our backyard. Apparently, he pointed at the dog, hands shaking, and told my mom, you keep that thing tied up when I'm around. Turns out, not being a dog person was an understatement. <laughs> the dog's name was Kato, like from the Pink Panther. <laughs> And maybe that should have been a sign. <laughs> it wasn't just that he was big. He was intimidating. He had a massive head with a black muzzle, thick jaws, and pointed ears. His dense double coat covered a body that was all muscle. Cato could have gotten the part of prison guard dog in any Hollywood movie. <laughs> After a rocky start when he walked right into our in-ground pool and Maureen had to wrestle her wet, <laughs> bewildered dog out of there, the first two weeks went well, according to letters my mom sent me at camp. Dad even conceded that for a dog, Cato seemed okay. But he still wouldn't go in the yard unless the dog was tied up. Maureen was gone a lot. So she conferred authority over Cato to my mom through some kind of dog talk, and it would obey if mom needed to chain it to a tree when Maureen wasn't home. After two weeks of camp, I came home for one night in my own bed and a home-cooked meal. Mom told me how she'd played fetch with Cato a little, and I saw him through the window, but I didn't end up going outside. She hung my sleeping bag on a clothesline to air out overnight, and the next morning, as I was packing to leave for camp again, I went out to get it. Kato was standing nearby. I had no reason to be afraid of him, so I leaned over to give him a pet on the back. All I remember after that was one thunderous bark. Woo! <laughs> and a mass of fur and teeth hurtling itself at my face. My hand flew to my mouth. It was wet and floppy. I started screaming and stumbled over to a sliding door that led to my parents' bedroom. The dog was now between me and the living room slider I'd come out of, and I was terrified he was going to lunge at me again. I pounded on the glass, and my dad, who'd been taking a nap in there, shot out of bed and tried to undo the lock, but he couldn't get it open. I'll never forget the panic in his eyes. Mom heard me screaming and rushed out this other sliding door. Kato was just standing there, so she guided me past him and into the bathroom, blood dripping through my fingers. After those first few seconds of staring in the mirror, my legs felt weak and everything started to throb. Mom led me out to the car, and I lay in the back seat, head on her lap, eyes closed, holding the washcloth to my mouth. Dad drove us to the hospital muttering, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, under his breath. And I thought that was really weird since we're not even Catholic. <laughs> when we got to the hospital, 
My middle-aged beanpole dad scooped up all 5'9", 115 pounds of me in his arms and carried me into the ER like I was a little girl. I still remember his quick, short steps, each one shaking a little under my weight. I felt helpless, the kind of helpless where time contracts and there is nothing anywhere but what is happening right now. At the emergency room, a doctor examined me and said it would be better if they called in a plastic surgeon to sew me up. The dog's canine tooth had connected at the bridge of my nose, leaving a star-shaped gash before scraping down to catch my lower lip, shredding it in half. The adrenaline was fading and my whole face hurt, so they gave me pain medication while we waited for the plastic, plastic surgeon to arrive, about 30 minutes later. Waiting gave me a chance to start worrying. <clears throat> My biggest fear was during a brief scare when we didn't know if Cato was up on his vaccinations and I thought I'd have to get rabies shots in the stomach. The thought of being scarred for life was so foreign that I couldn't even comprehend it. And when the plastic surgeon arrived, he was so kind and reassuring to both me and my parents, I felt like I was gonna be okay. When I came home from the hospital that afternoon, I had one long running stitch along the reddening scar on my nose, a few shorter ones at the bridge, and black pokey stitches sticking out of my now very swollen mouth. I lived in a reclining chair for about two weeks while mom took care of me, feeding me soft foods from a baby spoon. Kato was quarantined for 10 days by animal control and Maureen moved out. Later, we learned she'd had to sell him to cover the pound costs, and he was guarding a warehouse somewhere in Vegas. I pitied anyone who messed with that place. <laughs> Tenth grade started a few weeks later. On the plus side, I got out of PE for a semester. <laughs> And my mother let me start wearing makeup. As of school picture day, my scars were not that visible under foundation. It's been 40 years since then. I was scarred for life. But the plastic surgeon did such a good job, and my scars have faded, so no one, tell, no one can tell I was bitten in the face unless I pointed out. I don't even wear makeup anymore. The most lasting impact was I was now terrified of large dogs. Although in recent years, even that fear has faded, somewhat. I admire people who are willing to open their homes to others. It's generous and kind, commendable, really. Things I aspire to be, but in practice, I take after my dad, concerned about how it will affect everyone else. I'm just not gonna be that person who says, well, why don't you stay with us? <laughs> when one of our two cats died a couple years ago, thinking about how stressed it would make our remaining one to bring another cat into the mix, as much as I love multiple cats, makes me wanna just wait until he dies and start over. I don't blame anyone for putting their existing household first. Because sometimes your best intentions can literally come back to bite you. <laughs> Luis Julek, everybody.